Thank you, Caleb. Uh, we're blessed by some beautiful singing there, and I really appreciate the song selection there as it's going to tie in today's message. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. If you've got a Bible, we would encourage you to turn over to Matthew, the ninth chapter. We're going to be reading verses 35 through 38. We are so happy to be in God's presence. There's nowhere else that I would rather be than, than in his presence presence to remember as we just celebrated communion, to look upon Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, to remember the most significant event in all of human history, that he shed his precious blood for you and me. And this is a a place uh, to rejoice in, in the great works of God. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Please pray with me. So, Father, we come into your most awesome and wonderful presence, and we do so not by our own merit, Father. We confess our sins, we confess that we have fallen short, but we come by way of Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, who drank that bitter cup. And, Father, we rejoice and glory in him, and I pray, Father, that we would remember at this time your great love towards us, fallen sinners, and I pray, Father, uh, that we might uh, worship you, that we might be attentive to your word, and we might have a desire to share this great truth, Father, with a broken and lost world. Father, we thank you for the portion of scripture that you've given us this morning. I pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds, and Father, uh, give me, your servant, uh, the ability to communicate your truth. It's through Jesus mighty name that we pray. Amen. Matthew 9, beginning in verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds... He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. If you would notice verse 26 once more, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This word compassion is a very strong word and it expresses an inward stirring of deep emotions. He has the idea of an overwhelming sense of pity. It is to be moved in the inward parts. And the word is used in several places by the gospel writers to describe Jesus' tender feelings towards humanity. And it's so when Jesus looks out over this multitude, this crowd of people, that he's overwhelmed with this sense of compassion. And so this word, compassion, it might summarize the entire character and mission of Jesus from the very beginning, enduring to this day. He is moved with compassion for the lost children of Adam. For it is this same compassion that moved him from the joys of heaven to save this hopeless race. He descended into a cursed and fallen world in order that we might have the opportunity of ascending into the blessed state of eternal life in heaven. He became poor in order that we might become rich. And when on the cross, 
when he drank that bitter cup, was it not this compassion that moved him to sacrifice and to die in our place? And presently, as Jesus Christ this very day is enthroned before the Father, he intercedes on our behalf due to this compassion that he has for the weaknesses and the failures and the shortcomings that each one of us have. And it is compassion that caused him to not leave us as orphans, but he has given us the comforter. He has given us the Holy Spirit that we might not be left alone in this world. And look at one of the other instances in which this word compassion is used in Matthew 20, verse 33. There are two blind men that approach Jesus, and we read about this beginning in verse 33. They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, there's that word, in compassion, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. And I'm here to say this morning that Jesus continues to be moved with compassion, even to this day, to open the hearts of those who are spiritually blind. I want us to think about this morning and try to imagine a mother who has a strong love for her prodigal son who's gone astray. Can you picture this scene? Can you see her tears? Can you hear her prayers as she calls out to God that he might have mercy on her son? Can you understand the breaking of her heart for her son? This is a love that surpasses language. There's no way that we can get our mind um, and, and our hearts around the depth of this love that a mother has for her lost son, yet it does not reach the foothills of God's love for that same prodigal son. Now multiply that love to the entire human race. What an infinite ocean of divine love. Jesus' love is truly beyond understanding. How unsearchable is the heart of Jesus, the length, width, and depth, no, no end to the love of our precious Savior. And if we were to feel just a fraction of the love that Jesus has for you and me in this lost world, we would have no ability to bear that great burden. And surely as we consider this text this morning, our circumstances are no different than the time in which this story was written. Uh, the state of lost sinners is just as pitiful as we see here described this morning. And I want us to ask ourselves, what is your feeling, uh, for instance, when you look out over the large crowds of, of this city of, of Dallas, when you see the multitudes? Are you moved with pity for them? And, and I think about my own situation as, as I uh, live a little bit outside of town and I drive in to this large city and I see uh, the skyline, which represents multitudes of, of people. And sometimes the Lord just really convicts me and he hits me. Think about all the people who are walking outside of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and what is it to each one of us? Do we have this same love that Jesus had? I want us to consider Paul as he speaks to this subject. In Philippians 3.18, this is the way he describes the lost world. Chapter 3, verse 18 of Philippians. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. And maybe you say to yourself, well, I'm not much of an emotional person, and I imagine that Saul of Tarsus wasn't too emotional. 
But Paul is a new creation with a new heart that can feel, that is sensitive, that has a love for the lost world. He no longer has a heart of stone, but he has a heart of flesh which is tender. And he has the compassion of Jesus Christ living within his soul. I want us to consider also the mercy, the great mercy which Jesus has extended to us. Ephesians 2, 3, Paul writes the following, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in, once you once, in which you once walked. And then skipping down to verse 3, And were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And then consider here what God has done for each one of us. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Friend, does this great and infinite love stir you? Does it move you towards rejoicing in this great salvation? What God has done for you and does it move you to tell others how much God has done on our behalf? Many uh, truly uh, or may we truly call ourselves by his name Christian if his love does not reside in our hearts. And our compassionate God is looking for followers, even this morning, who are willing to share in his heart. He's looking for people that he can give this love and this burden to. And so Jesus describes the condition of this crowd. He says, uh, because they are harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And just this week, Bobby, our kitchen um, uh, minister, uh, the, the man that God has sent here uh, to help out with the feeding ministry, uh, he was talking to me and he said, you know, William, if you ever get the opportunity, you really just need to sit down at that window where we serve our food and you need to look out over that parking lot. And you need to just observe all the broken and needy people that come for our help. It is such a moving experience just to witness this, how true it is. And what a fitting illustration as we see the homeless, those whose bodies are impoverished, their bodies are wasting away, they're suffering in so many different ways. But how much more does Christ, whose eyes search deeper, much deeper within to see the poverty of the soul. How much more is he moved within his heart when he sees the pitiful condition of the sheep? It's also an indictment upon those who claim to be shepherds. This country is a breeding ground for false prophets and, and false teachers and, and cults who harass those who are vulnerable and they don't feed them. Once Jesus asked Peter a question, he said, do you love me? We might ask ourselves the same question this morning. Do we fulfill the greatest commandment? Do we truly love Jesus? Peter responded and said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And then Jesus responded and said, feed my sheep. And so if we love Jesus, we express that by feeding his sheep and taking care of those who are harassed and helpless, like this image we see of these sheep. So Jesus continues in verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I want us to think about this concept of of har harvest. It represents a season of time to gather crops and to reap the benefits of previous labor. Also, 
we might consider that there's a window of opportunity and we live in this time period. We live in the acceptable time, the year of the Lord's favor and grace. Today is the day of salvation and we need to make um, a proper use of this time and to realize where we sit in God's timeline. As we flesh out this idea of, of harvest, I want us to consider uh, the following implications. That during harvest, farmers work the hardest based on um, all the work that they do throughout a year. Harvest is the most intense time, and even in this country, historically, during the harvest period, schools would let out because of the overwhelming demand to bring the precious crops into the storehouse. And we also have the idea that every hour of light is most precious. And so during this time of, of harvest, from sun up till sun down, those farmers are working and taking, uh, making the opportunity of this precious um, light and the time period which they're in. And so I think this helps us to make sense of Jesus' words in John 9, 4. He says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And I want us to think about this. What would you say to a great king who entrusts his servants with his fields and then goes on a journey. And when he comes back, he, he finds out that his servants have not harvested his crops, but they've let his crops spoil. And for whatever reason, they weren't faithful to obey his orders. What do you think his response is going to be? And this story is, is talking about each one of us. Jesus Christ is coming back, and he has an ex an expectation for his church to be working while it is day to be toiling in his fields and we need to understand this great opportunity that lies in front of us. I came to this church about five years ago and, and before that I got into gardening. My grandmother, she was a, uh, a gardener and she loved to uh, farm and garden and, and plant all kinds of different vegetables and one summer I said, I'm going to break up a little plot of ground for her uh, so that she can enjoy doing what she loves doing. And uh, no sooner than I started getting out there and breaking up the soil, I fell in love with, with gardening. And, and so I had broken up a, a garden and planted all different types of, of plants and crops and, and vegetables. And then I came to do a two-month internship here in Dallas. Uh, meanwhile, my garden was back in Memphis, and, and one uh, day I found myself getting a little frustrated because I could see those weeds growing in my garden in Memphis, and there was nothing I could do about it being here in Dallas. And I could see the sun beating down and the plants withering, and I was pretty frustrated about that, and I began to pray and just really um, asked God to, to give me peace about this, and, and I didn't hear a vision, I didn't hear a voice from heaven, but I believe that God has the ability to convict our spirit and to impress things upon us, and it's as though uh, the Lord said to me, what about my church? How do you think the heavenly gardener feels when the weeds of this world begin to grow in his church and the world begins to influence his church. What do you think the pain and the frustration of, of his heart is? How do you think he feels when the gate is broken down and, and the boar comes in and tramples the, the soil and the precious crops are destroyed? And, and the Lord was really uh, convicting me to, to get my priorities straight and, and to have a concern for true spiritual things and, and to harness this zeal and, and passion and focus on, on his church and, and the lost. And so um, as we uh, continue here, 
we see that Jesus points out a problem. We read in verse 37, the harvest is plentiful. And so on one hand, um, this means that there is fruitful labor to be had. There are many souls to be saved. Harvest is a time of celebration when the riches of the field are brought into the, the storehouse. This is an amazing time. And, and on this note, there is nothing more wonderful in this life to be an instrument in the hands of God to be involved in the salvation of a soul. I hope that you long for this. I hope that you want to work in the fields of the Lord to harvest and to bring in souls into his house. So the harvest is plentiful. But the problem, as Jesus states, is the workers are few. And I want to point out here that every member in the body of Christ is involved in this activity, just like an Olympic runner. Every single member of his body is completely focused and straining to get across the finish line. He doesn't leave his hand behind. He doesn't leave his foot behind, but his every member is straining as one man to get across the finish line. And this is an image of the, of the church as we approach both domestic missions and foreign missions. Missions, And so we ask this question, why are there so few workers? Paul introduces a couple concepts in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Let's take a look here. So then, let us not sleep. And so we've, we've mentioned that it is daytime. Every single hour of light is most precious to us. Time is all that we have. It's our most precious commodity. But Paul mentions that the world is asleep. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. And so there's two reasons that Paul presents for why people are not out doing the work of God, they are, number one, asleep, and they are drunk. They are, they are intoxicated by the world, living according to the sinful nature, and they're asleep and blind. And the call of God for his church in this difficult hour in which we live is to be awake, to be living according to the Spirit to be about our Father's business while it is day because night is coming. To be constrained by the love of God which is given to us by the Holy Spirit that lives within the temple of our heart. And so we have a great problem. An overwhelming, a crippling problem that is presented before us. A lost world. We have multitudes who are harassed and helpless without a savior and with all things our God does not allow us to get in difficult circumstances without providing a solution we see this all throughout scripture and so the solution is given in verse 38 therefore Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so did you get the answer? The answer is prayer. Prayer is the answer. Prayer is the answer for a little congregation in the middle of a large church that's overwhelmed. Where do we even start? Let us go to God. Let us take this God sized problem to the Lord of the harvest and let him answer this prayer. Prayer is the answer to that mother that we talked about earlier that has the prodigal son. It's the answer to the preacher that feels overwhelmed from time to time. And let me draw your attention back to Acts 13 as we. Uh, take a, took a look at this last week. Uh, Paul and Barnabas find themselves at, at Antioch. 
And here we have two weak men with a nature just like ours. They're just men. There's nothing special about these people. And they look out at God's field, the world. And as they look out over the acreage, they see the field is plentiful. They see great numbers who need Jesus, and they are moved with compassion. And that compassion drives them to their knees, and it leads them to pray fervently and to worship the Lord with fasting. Acts 13, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands and sent them off. And I want you to consider the significance of this this call. God answers this prayer as they consider a lost world, as they come to God in worship and in prayer. The Holy Spirit sets them apart. And the significance is that as God answers that prayer and as he calls someone, this also means that he is going to give them the authority and the ability to be successful. And if you've read uh, the book of Acts and you've read uh, the rest of the New Testament, you know how incredibly successful these two missionaries were as we consider this, this call and this answer to prayer, I want us to look at Judges 6, 14. And these words were spoken to Gideon, who was called in a similar fashion. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. And so there's the significance of the call That God is sending these missionaries. And because God is sending them to save their people, they are going to be successful. And so this morning, I I want us uh, to, to ask the Lord that he would give us compassion by the Holy Spirit. That he would do something new and fresh in our heart, our hearts that he would enlarge our hearts, as the psalmist prays, that Romans 5, 5 might be a reality in our lives. And these things might be true as we read in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts Through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And friend, if God's love has been poured into your heart, you'll know about it. And people around you will know about it. If God has poured his compassion and his love into the hearts of a congregation, people around us, they're going to know about it. And they're going to uh, be amazed. And, And may we be encouraged and and strengthened to realize the times in which we live in order that we might labor in the master's service while it is day, remembering the precious sacrifice of our Savior uh, who was moved with compassion to save us from our sins. And may we not forget the solution for the crisis in which we are currently in, that we are to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, and the Lord does not tease us. What would you think if I were to go out to one of the nicest restaurants in town and buy a steak dinner, and then I was to sit down to some poor individual that was hungry and to eat that in front of him? How horrible and and wicked would that be to tease this man in this way. In scripture, we have promise after promise. We have an inheritance, and God 
does not put these things in front of us without coming true on that promise. If we ask, we will receive. And the promises find their yes in Jesus Christ. God is in heaven and he is waiting for people to call upon his name and he has an answer for us. I want you to consider Titus 3, 5. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. This morning, if you are not a Christian, Jesus is moved with compassion and he wants to do this very thing for you. If you would like to receive Jesus and have your sins washed away in baptism, or if you need any other prayers of the church for repentance, we would ask that you would come forward as we stand and sing our invitational song.